She's professor of history and Radcliffe alumni professor at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies. And so please welcome her. Right. <laughs> Hiya, Miles. Thank you. Thank you, Krishna. Thank you, Professor Gates. Thank you, everyone in the room, for your patience with me. I am directionally challenged, and I was actually across town. You were what? Across town. Oh, don't worry about it. We had waited all day. Oh. <laughs> now you take your time, and you do your thing. We can run a little long. <laughs> that is too sweet. So it is you know, really a pleasure and an honor to be here with you this you afternoon. Sounds like it's working now? Yeah. OK, thank you. So it is a pleasure and an honor to be here with you this afternoon to share aspects of a project in progress that I've really been wrestling with over the last two or three years. And my hope is that as I talk through with you some challenges I've confronted and some um, presumptions that I've entered in with and some conclusions that I'm arriving at, that you'll be able to help me to refine some of my ideas and to do better work with this particular object, which is a beautiful and rare and moving piece of African American women's material culture. Great. So what I want to do today is talk with you about a thing, an object, which puts me in uh, the terrain of object histories, uh, a terrain in which I didn't really expect to find myself because I'm more comfortable working with narrative uh, and text in the construction of my histories. I learned when I came across this object, which I'll show you in a moment and tell you about in a moment, that there was both a challenge and an opportunity in the project as it was developing. The challenge was I was going to be working with a thing, and I'm not used to working with things. Um, those of you who may have done some reading in new materialism studies will be familiar with the idea that uh, thing and object in these studies really carry different meanings, so that an object would be mostly viewed in this area of study as um, kind of a lifeless, inanimate item. And a thing would be viewed as um, an item that actually has uh, vibrancy, um, efficacy, the ability to uh, call our attention, uh, and to even perhaps encourage us to take an action. So you'll hear me using those terms interchangeably in my talk. But really, when I talk about this object, I always mean thing. I always mean a kind of item that calls our attention, um, that hails us, as our colleague Robin Bernstein has put it, and that encourages us, invites us into some kind of action. So the challenge for me was working with the thing for the first time. I'm not an art historian, I'm not an archeologist, um, but the opportunity I found was being compelled to think about how we in African American history and African American literary studies can look more closely at material culture items, look more closely at artifacts in our reconstruction of African American women's histories. I came to think as I continued to work with this thing, that I could look at it as an archive of its own. This was important, because the more I dug, the more I realized there are actually not solid pieces of evidence in the documentary record about this object. There's not a single one, not a single document uh, that helps to amplify and open out the meaning of the object that I want to talk with you about. So this is the thing I'm referring to. It has been called Ashley's sack. 
and it now lives SAC, SAC. and it now lives in the National Museum of African American History and Culture. I'll tell you about its trajectory in a second. My hope in working with this SAC is to try to understand uh, what it is, to try to understand who the people are who are named on it, to understand how they might have used this item, how it affected their lives, and what it can tell us about black women's history. I'm going to put up a transcription of this sack in a moment so you'll be able to see the words even more clearly. But um, basically what we have here is a family story that was embroidered onto a 19th century cotton seed sack or flower sack. So the bag itself dates back to uh, around the 1850s. The embroidery was put in place in the 1920s. What we know about the sack is what you see in front of you. And I'll move forward and see if I can move back again. This is the text. My great-grandmother Rose, mother of Ashley, gave her this sack when she was sold at age nine in South Carolina. It held a tattered dress, three handfuls of pecans, a braid of Rose's hair. Told her, it be filled with my love always. She never saw her again. Ashley is my grandmother, Ruth Middleton, 1921. So this is what it is. Um, this is what we have. This is the record or the evidence uh, of this sack. And of course you can see that the sack is, let me try to go back for a moment. At the same time, an artifact, a material object, and a text. It's poetic, it's beautiful, and when I read it, I tried to honor the spacing of the embroidery, which actually, um, I'm coming to think, represents a gap in the historical record of these women. There is a big chunk of missing information in the middle of their story, uh, right around the lines in the middle. So let me tell you now about um, how I came to encounter this sack, where it has moved to and from and why, how I'm trying to think about it. And um, then I want to talk a little bit about one of the items in the sack, which is the tattered dress. So I found out about this item in an unexpected way. I was giving a presentation at an environmental history symposium in Savannah, Georgia. And um, after my talk, which was about St. Simon's Island and Igbo Landing and the enslaved people there um, whose descendants um, have said that they flew home to Africa after I gave that talk, someone came up to me and asked me if I knew Ashley Sack. And he said, do you know Ashley Sack? And he was, he was very, um, kind of determined to introduce me to this object. I told him that I didn't know about it, I'd love to hear about it, thank you very much. I mean, there are always lots of people who want to talk after a public presentation, and started talking to the next person. Well, this individual um, tracked me down and started writing me emails um, about Ashley Sack. It turns out that he is a local journalist in the Savannah area, He's a blogger. He is a retired marine biologist. And um, one of the things he writes about in his marine biology slash local history blog are you know, what he calls pearls, that is lost items that might be recovered. So he told me that he had heard a presentation about the sack in Savannah given by a curator of a plantation house museum 
outside of Charleston. He sent me a copy of his blog post about the sack, and he, he wrote me you know, pretty regularly. It was interesting um, about his work in marine biology, about his home on St. Simon's Island, and also about the rising waters around the island, about the flooding, about the environmental threat uh, that he was facing in his home and that he felt um, local sites in Savannah might be facing. And so he put me on the trail of the sack. I started looking into it. And what I found is basically what you're seeing. I found an image online. Because when he told me about the sack, this was the winter of 2016, it had actually been moved. It was no longer at the plantation site where the curator had come from there to talk about it in Savannah. This was that plantation, Middleton Place. You see the name that's the same, Ruth Middleton, Middleton Place. And this is the museum in DC where the sack is now. So the sack's journey ended up being very compelling, very interesting, as I discovered once I dove into it uh, months later. I first saw it um, in the flesh after the museum opened. It was in storage at the time I found out about it because it was being moved. And um, after I saw it, I just felt completely captivated by it, so moved by it. I was, I, was, I was so saddened by it, just overtaken by it, but it was deeply beautiful and it affected me you know, in ways that seeing the irons and chains that were used on enslaved people, um, seeing, seeing places where, where they were you know, abused and tortured, where they gave of their life's blood for the lifeblood of others, actually had not affected me. I felt captivated and a little bit obsessed by it. And um, I felt that I needed to work on it. And it turned out that other people who were already working on it had also felt kind of obsessed and captivated by this thing. So here's what happened and here's how it got to be there. Um, this is the contemporary history of the SAC, which is Somehow, um, over the course of the 20th century, it fell out of the hands of this family of women that I'll talk about in a moment. And it ended up at a flea market in Tennessee in a bin of old rags and, scrap, and fabric scraps. Um, there in the early 2000s, like around 2007, uh, a white woman who was a regular flea market shopper came across it, and she's a person who was accustomed to going to flea markets and you know, tag sales and finding items and sprucing them up and putting them on eBay. And she used the money to help put one of her children um, in, in private school. And she was shopping, she, she came across the, the sack, and she kind of, as she described it, was surreptitiously reading it as she was shopping and realizing there was something here and kind of trying to hide her realization from the seller for fear that he would charge her more. And so she quickly said, I'll give you $20 for the lot, you know, the whole kind of bin of rags. Uh, he took the money, she bought this item and other pieces of fabric for $20 and went home and started Googling. What she noticed first was the name Middleton. And she realized that there was a, a big plantation called Middleton Place outside of Charleston. She contacted the Middleton Place um, curators. This, by the way, is just one single remaining piece of this plantation architecture. This was one wing of the house. It was their guest quarters. The rest of the house um, was, was destroyed. Um, through a series of uh, events, uh, fire, warfare. And uh, this is preserved now and is, is presented as if the plantation family had, had lived in that part of the house. The curators are straightforward and honest about the fact that it is a visitor's quarter, but they have kind of dressed it up as if it was the, the main home of the family. So the flea market shopper 
made this connection, contacted Middleton Place um, Foundation. It's now privately owned, um, but the head of the foundation at the time um, was a descendant of the Middletons. So an independent nonprofit um, foundation operating a site open to the public, which is a national landmark, but where still there were stakes in preserving the honor of this Middleton family, given that uh, the president of the time was a, a Middleton descendant. So the flea market shopper contacted uh, the Middleton Place staff. They were incredibly excited and were encouraging her um, to allow them to purchase the item. She apparently did more investigating. She made some calls to some auction houses. She did some soul searching. She says that she had a dream. And um, remember, she also had children. Her daughter at the time was nine. So she decided that she would um, donate the item to Middleton Place. Um, she did donate it for, in exchange for a small sum and uh, a lifetime membership uh, at the historic site. So, so a little bit of money did change hands, which I think is actually very important and uncanny. It's strange. It sits with me. It bothers me. I don't know what to think about it. Uh, she, paid she was paid $100 in our time um, for the sack. And $150 was paid in the 1850s for Ashley. So Middleton Place Plantation had the sack. You realize they had uh, an incredible artifact. The curators there started doing research into the item and into their records. They have incredible records in some of the rooms of this building. Um, and they looked very carefully and could actually not find an Ashley in their plantation records. I have looked very closely. I have not found an Ashley in their plantation records. And what they have done is um, straightforwardly and honestly kind of edited what it is that, that they presented about the sack. They now say that there's no direct connection between the sack and probably Ruth Middleton and her family and Middleton Place. Though a scholar who has done quite a lot of work on this, an anthropologist and art historian named Mark Auslander, has suggested that Ruth Middleton's husband, Arthur Middleton, may have been descended from people who were enslaved here. That's not conclusive yet. It is um, a hypothesis uh, that, that could make sense. So um, Middleton Place owns the item. Middleton Place had been displaying the item. The curators have described the ways in which people who came through to see the sack, which used to be displayed in that building in, in kind of a, an entryway, um, that people who came to see the sack would read it and then burst into tears, such that uh, they became accustomed to having a box of tissues next to the item. Now we should think about that, and there are a lot of things to think about that. I have to be you know, straightforward and say, when I first saw the, saw the sack online, I did not cry. I think I felt something more powerful than tears, that there is such a thing. And while I recognize, and I think we recognize, that, that emotional reactions and responses can be productive, we might also ask what kind of emotional and social work is actually being done when people go into a plantation house and they see a bag that was passed down um, through a family of enslaved women and girls, and then they cry, and then they leave and continue on with their vacation. What's actually transpiring there, we could ask. Though I do not mean to undercut the genuineness of, of their emotions. So Middleton Place owns the sack. They have the sack on display. When curators from the New Smithsonian Museum went on an artifact finding tour across the country looking for collections because um, they didn't have collections yet for this museum. They came to uh, South Carolina, curators at Middleton Place brought the sack to an event they had, and then the Smithsonian borrowed the sack. So it's now in DC, but it's on loan. And uh, I was told by the former head of the Middleton uh, Place Foundation, the descendant of the Middletons, 
that he's thinking about taking it back. And um, what he indicated to me in an informal conversation in the hallways of that building is that he's not so happy with how it is being displayed. Uh, part of that has to do with where it is on the wall. Have any of you seen the sack at the museum? Have any of you been to the museum yet? Sure. Right, of course. So I mean, it's, it's, hard, it's, it's hard to see. There are, a lot of, there are a lot of sacks at that museum. There are. <laughs> and it's hard to see. I mean, it, it's hung um, like, you know, like here. And so to see it, you have to you know, bend or, or stoop down. It's actually next to the auction block um, un underground. Uh, in the section yeah. where slavery is being interpreted. Yeah, but it's easy to miss. And he's not happy about that. Um, this is a posh. Such a, and when you go down there, the weight of emotion is such that half the time your tears, are, your eyes are filled with tears, so mm -hmm. you're going to miss all kinds of stuff. I mean, well, it, this is true. It is one of the, it is the most profoundly emotional response I've ever had in any museum. And I've been to a million museums, including yeah. every black man. <laughs> History was in the United States, I guess. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it's remarkable. It really is. It is remarkable. Suddenly, suddenly done, not kitsch. Right. Yeah. And it's juxtaposed in that gallery with um, the poem The Slave Mother by Frances L. Watkins Harper. And on the wall behind it are, are just brief quotations uh, from sale advertisements for enslaved people and enslaved children. Um, I was really moved when I first saw it because one of the, one of the lines right behind it um, is about the sale of a boy who was the age of, of my son. It's, it is quite compelling and quite moving. Um, but the foundation um, director at the time was concerned about its placement. I think he felt that it was a demotion for it to be so low. There are multiple meanings there, I think. But also there was a concern that apparently the bag uh, had been described as a pillowcase in some instances as facility and curators discussed it. And um, the Middleton Place staff weren't happy with, with the pillowcase designation. They also seemed to be uncomfortable. They didn't tell me this, this is my interpretation. With the, um, with the statement that that coincides with the sack in lots of places, that the sack itself was made from, uh, quote, Negro cloth, which was uh, an inferior kind of fabric that was procured, especially for the clothing of enslaved people. Um, they had a strong reaction against this idea that it is Negro cloth. One of the curators there told me that, um, and she's a textile expert, um, she told me that she looked at it under a high-powered microscope and that she saw linen in it, and that's partly what's leading her to think that it was not, you know, uh, of the coarse base material that goes into Negro cloth. Um, I want to say that I'm trying to make sense of this, and I think that there is an investment there of, of some kind around how this item is to be valued. It's an investment around well, one to present the item as, you know, kind of a very a lofty, elevated, um, you know, a, a high level piece of art, as opposed to, you know, a low, you know, kind of dirty, grungy, you know, deeply interconnected with the humiliations of slavery, uh, piece of material culture. So when I started researching the sack after visiting it, I found that there was some work that had been done. Uh, Mark Auslander is one person who's done work, as I mentioned. Heather Williams, a historian of African-American um, slavery and families, has done work on it. Um, if any of you have read Heather Williams' book, Help Me to Find My People, she concludes it with a description of Ashley Sack, where she uses this story as an example of the many, many families who actually were never able to reunite um, during or after slavery, and especially after the Civil War, when so many families um, went to incredible lengths, undertook great feats, to try to reestablish their family circles. So I started researching the SAC and um, looked through the records in South Carolina 
and concluded, as had already been concluded by Middleton Place curators and Mark Alexander, that there didn't seem to be a direct tie to Middleton Place because there's no Ashley in the records. And also learned, and this was actually a very helpful thing, that in the slavery records of South Carolina, and even broadly speaking in the slavery records, Ashley is a very unusual name for, um, for a black girl or a woman. Ashley only came up three times in all of the records that have been preserved in South Carolina or about South Carolina slavery that I was able to access. Now, I will grant you there is always more material, and there may be material in private holdings. Maybe there's material you know, out in California somewhere about South Carolina slaveholders that I didn't know about and didn't see. But in the records that I did look at, which covered the whole period of South Carolina enslavement, there were only three Ashleys. And only one of those Ashleys was um, in the holdings of a person who also owned a rose. Now, rose was a more common name in the records. There were, there were many roses. There were many, um, there were many roses in the Middleton Place records and across the, the South Carolina um, slaveholders records, but only one with an Ashley. And this Rose and this Ashley were both owned by Robert and Milbury Serena Martin, who lived in Charleston and who also lived, uh, who had a plantation in Barnwell District in uh, the interior of South Carolina uh, in the 1830s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. Their records indicate that in 1852, Robert Martin died of brain disease. And his will had directed his, his wife, who was the executor of his estate, to liquidate his assets upon his death so that she could pay um, the equivalent of what would today be around $60,000 to each of their children. So after his death, the South Carolina records show Serena, excuse me, uh, Milbury Serena Martin selling off all kinds of property. Though a slave um, bill of sale for Ashley does not seem to exist. I haven't found one, and no one else seems to have found one. Though I will tell you, that there is a document on the internet that's circulating that says Ashley's bill of sale, but it is not a bill of sale. Um, while a bill of sale doesn't exist for Ashley, we do have the estate inventory for, the, uh, for Robert Martin's estate, for his property there in Charleston and his property um, in Barnwell, the plantation. He also owned many lots of land in Charleston. He owned a hotel and other lots of land close to the Georgia border. And that estate inventory says that there was a girl. Let me back up. It doesn't say there was a girl. It, it says there was a person named Ashley in his holdings who was valued at $150. Um, she seems to have been a girl because of her uh, low monetary value. Um, in comparison, Rose, who was owned by the Martins, was valued at $700. And Rose was stationed here at their, um, their urban manor house. So what seems to be indicated by the records connected to the Martin family is that once Martin died and his, his holdings were um, liquidated so that the children could have lots of cash, Ashley was sold, and that was, is what precipitated um, her mother Rose to pack the sack with whatever it is, um, uh, as I interpret it, that she could get her hands on, and also what it was that, that she thought would keep her daughter um, alive, sustained, and nourished on multiple levels. So in treating this, this object and trying to understand it and, and trying to draw closer to it and the women who, 
who created it and crafted it and passed it down, I started by looking at the items in the sack and trying to figure out what it is that I could say about these items. Because again, as I think you heard, the documentary trail is very, very thin. It is so thin that I cannot tell you that I know for a fact that Rose and Ashley were owned by Robert and Bill Berry. I think they were. I feel 99% certain that they were, um, again, because of the rarity of Ashley as a name for a black girl, and actually as a name for any girl before uh, the 1960s. But that's not known for certain. What's known for, for certain, I, I want to kind of separate that word out here, about the sack is actually what the sack itself says. I want to go back to it. So what's known for certain is what it says. And, and by that I mean this is the only document that exists. But of course, we can't be certain about this certainty. There are so many questions we have to ask about it um, as scholars, as, as scholars of history, as people who would seek to engage seriously and with complexity with the history of slavery. Um, because as I said earlier, this is a text, you know, it's a, it's a narrative that was recorded by Ruth um, in the 1920s. Ruth seems to have received this story orally. We can, we can hear it in the sack. We can hear, I think we can, right? I mean, we can hear kind of the cadence of speech uh, we can hear some of, the, some of the black vernacular coming out. Um, we, can, we can see that Ruth probably knew Ashley in person because at the end she says Ashley is my grandmother. She claims her in, in the present tense, in the present moment. Um, I think we can, can even see some quoted speech there, an indication of quoted speech in the red line, which is set apart by color. And, um, in a red line that was stitched by a woman who uh, would actually become very involved in her church later in life. Um, it's stitched in red, and you know, as we know, uh, in the Bible, Jesus' lines are often quoted in red. So this seems to be a story that Ruth heard, and heard, and heard again, and heard again, until it settled in her mind like this, but it took her decades to, to uh, write it down, you know, to stitch it out. And the moment she did this was actually soon after she gave birth to a daughter. She gave birth to her daughter, Dorothy, and then she stitched this. So what we know with certainty is, is, is a record based on um, oral history, yes, but also memory. So it, like, any trace of the past um, has to be treated with, with a little bit of distance, with some questioning, with, with some wondering about how much of this memory um, could we say is factual? How much of it can we say is reliable? Um, how much of it can we say we could stand up next to a record like a bill of sale? One of the things I'm trying to work through in this project is um, coming to a place where I can say, yes, I accept this as a record that not only stands up against the bill of sale, but knocks that bill of sale down. That is actually more important, more central, more meaningful, more powerful, more reliable than all of those slave records and slave lists because of a truth that sits in the center of it, in the middle of it, that is actually even more true than the facts that we feel we can glean from all of those records. I'm working through this. I'm not sure how convincing it's going to be um, to folks or to some folks, um, but we'll see. But we'll see. I mean, I'm working here with an idea um, that's been written about by our colleague Walter Johnson as um, abundant truths. And he 
writes that he arrived at that particular sense through his discussions with divinity scholars such as um, David Carrasco. Abundant truths that you know, are, are big and wide open, that have lots of room in them for different interpretations, and that don't necessarily have to rely on the kinds of documented facts that we are most used to turning to in our search for historical evidence. So, One of the ways that I'm trying to think about this, this uh, narrative, this document, this record, this archive, because if we think of this sack as it was originally given, um, it was an archive. I mean, it was a collection of all kinds of things um, that were preserved and passed down. One of the things I'm trying to do as I think about it as an archive and a text and a narrative is to put it up against those other kinds of records and, and see what comes out of that, um, of that adjacency. And one of the things that I've arrived at is Ruth Middleton has, um, in her creative act of hearing the story, interpreting the story, uh, remembering the story, and writing it or stitching it down on the cloth, that she has created um, a contestation to and an alternative to the slave list. And when I say the slave list, I'm talking about all those documents and records that um, I spent so much time with in the South Carolina archives that uh, those who study slavery spend so much time with, where all we get to know about enslaved people is something that occurs or something that is recorded in you know, a dry, cold, distant, dehumanizing list that might tell us their name, perhaps maybe, maybe an age, um, that, that might tell us what their monetary value was presumed to be, that might tell us how many children were born to that person, because of course that's another means of building wealth, that might tell us you know, how many yards of fabric were doled out to that person, how many shoes, etc., but would never tell us the kinds of things that really matter the truths that are inherent in this document that Ruth tells us as she reconstructs or crafts this alternative kind of slave list based on the stories of her foremothers. So I'm looking at this as a different kind of list, you know, um, as a catalog of necessities, of needful things that an enslaved mother who was being torn away from her darling child felt that girl would need to survive. And these things, as, as Ruth remembers it, or as she chooses to tell it, include, as you see in her number, um, the tattered dress, the pecans, a braid, and um, also her love. I'm trying to organize this, this project, this thinking and writing project around all of these things individually, around the sack as a thing and an archive in its totality. Um, and, and I'm thinking about love also, you know, as, as, as a thing, as a real thing that Ruth remembered having heard Ashley, I think, tell it that Rose gifted. So I'm running, um, I think, toward the end of our time. So uh, I'm not going to, to read to you the section that I've written on the tattered dress. But what I'll do is just continue to talk through some of the things that I'm thinking about um, with regard to the items in the sack. So I'm trying to pay attention to the way in which Ruth has ordered her list, trying to think about priority, wondering if this is the order that she heard or if this is an order that she chose, you know, when she decided to, 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 um, to stitch it down. It's interesting to me that um, Ruth Middleton, who uh, moved to Philadelphia with her husband Arthur right um, around the time of World War I, Ruth Middleton became quite um, a figure in her church. 
St. Simon's Church in Philadelphia. She was written about um, in not only the church um, kind of social paper, but also written about in, in the local Philadelphia um, black press as somebody who was, who was always well-dressed. And, and, and her outfits are described to a T. Her hats, the fabric she wore, where she was going, where she was traveling to. Um, Ruth Millicent cared about clothes. Now, I, I don't know, I don't think we can know, if, um, if Rose felt the tattered dress was the first priority, only that it was a needful thing. But I think this says something about, about uh, Ruth Middleton, for sure, that she thinks clothing was incredibly important. Um, as I try to work through how to think about what the tattered dress can tell us about this family of women and enslaved women, and um, the importance and role of things and movable goods, movable property to black women, women and black people. I really try to think about um, not only the ways in which clothing was rationed, the ways in which black people were made to wear um, slave dress that was kind of akin to prison uniforms and meant to set them apart and to subjugate them, um, and not only the ways in which black women, as Stephanie Camp has shown so wonderfully, use their time in the evenings, their creativity, their resourcefulness to gather you know, all kinds of, of uh, materials that they could find to make their own clothing, um, you know, really according to um, their own reflections and observers' reflections, quite striking items of clothing. I'm looking at, at these things, but not only this, I'm also looking at the ways in which um, dress could have served the purpose, perhaps in Rose's mind, of not only protecting the outer body of her extremely vulnerable daughter, but also protecting the inner dignity, you know, the honor of that girl. And I think that that is what um, Ruth was, was projecting when she made sure as the descendant of enslaved women who were um, refused the privilege of wearing beautiful things in many, in many instances. Um, I think that was Ruth was, is what Ruth was saying when she chose to dress herself so carefully. So I'm looking at um, clothing and the dress as a form of outward protection and as um, a form of the protection of an inward honor I'm thinking about this dress as um, a statement that Rose may have been making, which goes beyond the basic need of, of um, kind of clothing oneself. And I think the statement was also um, about shelter in a sense. When we think about uh, things that are necessary for survival, uh, shelter is on the list. Of course, Rose didn't have her own shelter that we know of. She couldn't bestow shelter to her daughter in ways that we'd be familiar with exactly, but a dress could be a form of shelter. A dress could be a form of shield. And it actually was for white women in this period. And here I'm drawing from the work of Drew Gilpin, Drew Gilpin Faust and also Laura Edwards, who's a a uh, legal historian who's been looking quite a lot at textiles. Um, white women in this period, when they wore those huge dresses and the hoop skirts and all of this, um, they were symbolically protecting their bodies, protecting that domestic sphere that they were um, supposed to be um, the queens of. They were able to create a sense of distance between themselves and others through their dress. And one thing I try to think through is, is how might enslaved women like Rose been trying to do something akin to this, but of course in circumstances that were absolutely dire and that were um, life and death. So I try to, to think about dress by looking at a number of slave narratives, full-length slave narratives, WPA, uh, um, Works Progress Administration, Federal Writers Project <laughs> interviews, often referred to as the ex-slave narratives, looking at how dress is described there. Um, I look at black women as um, the producers of, of fabric and cloth on plantations. 
I look at contests between black women and, and white women over clothes. Um, I look at white women's diaries um, and letters and their descriptions of black women and their dress and uh, the ways in which white women um, of the slaveholding classes routinely criticized and castigated black women for their dress. And um, then I come around in this chapter to talking about how even as dress was um, kind of a battlefield for black women who were attempting to defend themselves um, and for white people who were always attempting to, white people of the slaveholding class and also people who didn't have slaves but sought to be in that class, who were always attempting to subjugate blacks, that this was kind of a, an ongoing battle between them. I put that next to the reality that black women and white women, enslaved and free, were also connected through dress and through fabric. That even as black women were um, on those plantations, in those weaving houses, making, uh, making thread, and then weaving cloth, and then making clothing, white women were often overseeing that work. And um, all women in the 19th, 19th century South, excuse me, um, were under the sway of the regime of the needle, as I'm referring to it in the chapter. There are clearly very distinct degrees of power that take place here. But I'm trying to look at the ways in which this dress not only opens us, opens up to us, Rose's experience perhaps, Ashley's perhaps, black women's perhaps, this, uh, this, this ongoing um, sartorial warfare, but also what it tells us about white women and um, their status in the slaveholding South and um, their attempts to signal their own status and stability through dress and, um, and their failures in doing so. There's a lot more to be said about the pecans and, um, and quite a lot to be said about the braid, which Maybe we'll get to if we have time for discussion. But you know, I'll just stop now, and I thank you so much for for your attention. Thank you. I found that you know I would find that very moving, um, and everyone else would. I especially because it's about. Uh, genealogy, among other things. Mm -hmm. There are four generations of one family represented. Yes. Remember, it's a great-grandmother. That means there's a grandmother. And there's a mother, and then she's the daughter of the unnamed mother, yes, right? right? So that's four generations if you're doing a black family tree. that yes. A document like that's a gold mine. Another lesson that um, everyone, particularly students, should take away is that we're all raised to know so painfully that at any given point, I'm rounding this out, but let's say in the 1860 census, 90% of the African-American people were enslaved. Actually, it was 89%, all right? So if you're descended from a, what used to be called free Negro or free person of color, your ancestors' records are in the paper trail. If you're in the 89%, your ancestors are not in standard um, paper trails like a federal census, right? But they are in probate records. And that's been one of the most pleasant surprises for me <laughs> doing Find Your Roots over the last 15 years is that you can actually find a lot of about your enslaved black ancestors, but you have to find the white person, and there were black slave owners, of course, mm -hmm. um, the white or black person, but overwhelmingly white slave owners, uh, who owned them. And if you do, then in probate records, it, it's so simple, but you could have knocked me over a feather 15 years ago when it was pointed out to me. If you want to leave your slave Henry to your daughter, you have to name him <laughs> in your will, if you're paying taxes, et cetera, et cetera. You know, they're just a series of, of legal documents. Now, if you, and most of these are, you don't have to go to the archives, but you know, m many of these are scannable, uh, digitized. There's been a huge revolution. It's always better to go to the archives, of course.
But you can do a lot just sitting at your desk at your computer uh, through Ancestry.com, or you know, which is a gateway to Family Search, which is a group by the Latter Day Saints, which just exists. They're like the Borg in Star Trek. I mean, they just exist to eat documents, you know, digi digitize documents. Now, Rose and Ashley, I would say, and all of all of the uh, conclusions that we reach on our TV show are vetted by historians like her. Um, you know, many of them at Harvard or Yale or, you know, the greatest historians um, in the country are paid to read, you know, to review the research. So you can, I, you know, unburden yourself. If you, did, if you looked at, there are a lot of slave owners in South Carolina and Georgia. But if you've looked at all of the probate records and done a search for Rose and Ashley, and there's only one, the key is using adverbs. You, you very likely, it is quite probable that, and then you're fine. And everybody who reviews it will assume that they are the two people. I'm already convinced. As long as you actually have looked at the probate records, which exist and are digitized. Now, there are always things that have, haven't yet been digitized. So once you do that for the relevant uh, areas, then the two relevant areas were Savannah and and... South Carolina, right? Um, then I think that part's um, solved, right? But I would still encourage you to qualify it with quite likely or very likely or mo most probable. But everybody's going to go um, is, is going to go with it. But I'm curious, what do you think of? Um, and so I found this deeply moving and uh, enterprising, and you know, and I'm in, deeply admiring of of this project that you're doing, like all of your work, as you know. She was our undergraduate student, and we've been admiring her for a long time. <laughs> um, but what remains to be done before you turn this loose? Because, mm -hmm. you know, I see you when we all watch, you're wrapped up in this, in the cloth and the linen. <laughs> you're in the sack, you know. I, am. <laughs> I know. <laughs> And you got to come out of that sack sooner or later because you're a scholar and you got to finish and you got to move on. And you got to share this person's story. So I just wonder, what are your next steps? Well, thank you for all those um, comments and for the question. The first thing you said reminded me to share that there is a missing mother, um, yes. as, as some of you may have noticed as well. I wish I knew why she has not been named. Um, but I believe that um, she is Rosa. Ruth Middleton is actually somebody who has a lot of paper connected to her mm -hmm. because of the, the time um, when she lived and where she was. And we can see through her marriage license application uh, and through census material that her mother's name was Rosa. And um, as we know, African-American families often did name children in honor of, of of people in the family line. So it makes, um, it makes very good sense that Rosa is the missing mother. I wish I could know why she was missing. Again, that, that middle section, that spatial kind of gap, also reflects a gap in, in the records. Mm -hmm. what, what does the census records say? When you trace them forward, is, is Rosa living with the, the daughter? They're not living together. No, not at any time. In 1910, 1890? Let me see. Let me see. Let's see if I can remember that. That's one way to do it. Maybe they are. I have done it, but I just can't bring it to mind. Sure. Maybe, maybe they are still in, in Columbia. They were in Columbia, South Carolina by that time period, the 1870s, you know, 80s period. Right. Well, it's just one other way you could do it is just track the family forward to see who's living in the household. Yeah. And that... If you find that, that's another way of reinforcing your association between the two people, but mm -hmm. I'm sure that's um, occurred to you. Yes. But yeah, it is it's, a missing, it's, it's a missing mother, it's, it's you, you know. I know. What I wonder about is, um, which I will, I'm sure, never get to know, is what that suggests about Ruth and those family relationships um, that Rosa is not, is not uh, in the story as given. Maybe they had a bad day. You know how it is between mothers and bad children. Bad day, you know, or some bad years. Yeah, I, right. I don't know. And, um, 
But why are you, why, what about this, I'm confused about the plantation guest house people yes. in Savannah who are pissed off at the national yes. African-American people. This is like the politics of, not ob objectivity, as that would be a pun, but mm -hmm. the politics of museum ownership, oh, yes. you know, I said, it's slave cloth, Negro yes. cloth. No, it's got linen. Yes. It yes. can be. Well, screw you. I'm taking my sack back. You know? <laughs> this happens oh. all the time in museums. This is not some straightforward thing, right? Well, so I, I, um, I do see a video camera. And I, I, I have tried to be um, gentle around this. Um, yeah, this is being webcast. <laughs> right, uh, right. Um, and, and to, and to kind of indicate that, I mean, there are stakes, and a lot of what I shared um, regarding kind of ownership and, and who's borrowed what and what people have said, I think has to do with how it is that the, the different sites and site staff um, feel invested in, in the item. But what you say about, I mean, who owns it being, you know, um, a matter of tension and conflict, I think it's so important because it, it reflects that history. I mean, it reflects the, it's the history of who owned Rose, who owned Ashley, you know, who's, who's tussling over black artifacts sure. and who was tussling over black bodies and, and, and what can we say about that with, with, you know, with respect for different people's positions and relationship to the project. And one thing that I say, um, in the manuscript I'm working on is that if it weren't for that white woman flea market shopper, of course. You know, we wouldn't have this. Most of the people who work with this sack are, are white. You know, everybody has, has a part to play. Um, at the same time that I think that the contemporary museum politics really are a reflection of how we do not get to walk away from our past. Those power dynamics um, reappear. Um, they may take different shape, but they are still with us. Yeah. Oh, one other footnote. I would suggest that you translate $150 in 1852 mm -hmm. into today's dollars, which is a lot more. So it it's not an equivalent. 20 mm -hmm. 150, it's not that ratio. It's, I don't have a calculator. Anybody could Google it. You could Google how much is $150 from yes, 1850. I have, I did. It's in the manuscript, but I didn't say it today. That's right. Yeah. I try to keep the numbers um, both in the past time and in the present time. Um, so that people can get that sense of how much money we're actually talking about. Right. Questions, comments? Thank you. This was so moving, and I understand um, how you um, were so affected by this artifact. And so part of the question I have is, um, historian to historian, you know, how do we... Um, navigate our own feelings about the artifacts and um, so that's one thing about you know how that has shaped your work mm -hmm. and I'm just imagining you going into the field to find these papers and being really motivated by this and I think that sometimes these artifacts have like a, a spirit in them yes. that I know this is not academic sounding but I think yes. that they uh, spirit is tied to this, and sometimes they come to certain people, and maybe it came to you for a reason. Um, I w but I was curious about why the, underneath the red, and I love the reading about maybe it's something like in the Bible where Jesus' words are red and made to stand out. I thought that's but it's thing. right? Mm -hmm. You thought that? See, I mean, I, oh, oh, Rivers got me. Um, <laughs> but the second section underneath is indented in, and just because I'm sitting in the front row, I can see there's a patch of lighter colored material, a square patch that's been sewn. So I'm wondering if there was, if it was always indented. Where? Do you see that? No, I don't see it. Am I imagining this? No. It's a square. Oh, okay. Here. Mm -hmm. Well, there's another one by that. Oh, I'm wondering if, if you think that was original or is it, is came it later. The left -hand quarter there? Yes. Possibly, yeah. Under the folds are. Uh huh. Yep. Maybe there. But I definitely see that and that the indent. Falling apart after. Probably, yeah. <laughs> but I wonder if any words were lost. I mean, it doesn't seem like it, but what yeah. isn't it? Could anything have been lost? And the third is, are there any living relatives of the Middletons? And do they want to claim on this artifact? 
All right. So, uh, we'll remember, see remember the lawsuit. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right, 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 exactly. So, that happens. Yes, indeed. So, starting with the, the second question, the bag has been patched, and this is something that the curators at Middleton Place looked at carefully and, and tried to, um, to make a note of. The kind of patching that was done, it doesn't seem to have cut into the, into the text. It seems that the text was originally indented um, because it, it still kind of holds together yeah. as a narrative. Um, someone suggested this to me when I was talking about the, the sack in Georgia, which I did not see before somebody mentioned it which was that maybe Ruth was going for you know, the shape of a heart in her, in her stitching. Um, it's possible. I mean, it is an interesting shape. I mean, I think the order or the, the shape, the lines, to me, um, bring to mind the, the careful structure of a poem. But, but, but I think, after having heard that, that maybe it is meant to be you know, a shape as well, which would help to explain um, the indentation. Um, you asked if there are uh, Middleton descendants. I have not found any indication that there are. And um, I'm actually working with a really terrific uh, genealogist, uh, Hannah Scruggs, who's um, also um, working in the museum in DC in the genealogy department. Um, and she's helping me to try to pin down the familial lines and uh, she hasn't found descendants either who would be lineal descendants. Um, Ruth and Arthur Milton had a daughter, Dorothy. There's no indication that Dorothy married or had children. Um, but, but children can pop up, you know, <laughs> as, as we know. So um, it's possible there are lineal descendants. Um, it's more likely, and it's probably it's a case, that there would be descendants from, you know, uh, cousins. And the second question was about emotion, right? Um, I had a hard time with this, and not just because of the sorrow. But also because of um, the difficulty I had stepping away emotionally from, um, from the story and from the moment. It's funny because, uh, yeah, I, I did feel like I fell into the sack, like you fall into a well. Um, not just the material culture aspects, I got a lot about fabrics and you would probably, you know, wanted to run screaming out of here if I had actually read my dress section because there's so much about the various kinds of fabrics in there. Um, but it is an emotional well too. And I would... I would read this and look at it, stare at it, transcribe it. I've written it out so many different time, you know, times and in different ways to try to, to understand it. What I haven't done, which I know is, um, is um, a method that some people use, I think it's really interesting, is try to actually reproduce the item in the way that it was created. So I mean, I am not an embroiderer and I'm not much of a sewer. I mean, I can, you know, I can patch a hole, but not much more than that. But that would be another process, another way of kind of trying to approach the object and get, to get closer to it. I haven't done that. Um, I have really dwelled with it, though, which makes it hard for me to step back from it and to, to bring a sense of scrutiny to it. Um, I compared it to slave lists, but I am tough on those slave lists, or at least I think I am. I try to be. You know, I, I encounter them with a sense of like, you know, okay, let's go, right? Um, but with this, I couldn't do that. And what I ended up doing, I think, for a long time was just being with it. And I was writing all kinds of things. I mean, I was writing about my grandmother. I was writing about a quilt in our family. Um, I was writing, you know, almost like memoir, memoir types. I had to get this, I had to, to deal with that, those feelings. Of, of like se separation, isolation, terror, longing, um, and to figure out how I could try to think about them and to recognize them and to write about them, but also step outside them to be, you know, the thinker, um, 
you know, alongside of you all today who can look at them with some distance. So I guess the way that I've done it is um, I let myself just fall into that well and let myself do all kinds of writing, which is why this is taking longer than probably it should. Um, and now I'm trying to step back. Mm -hmm. um, so what I said about Ruth Middleton and, and her, her dress, that only occurred to me like last month you know, or something, mm -hmm. as I'm trying to actually step back and see Ruth more as you know, a writer and think about the, the craft and construction of this object. You know, one narrative device that you could use, which might be completely irrelevant, um, would be to do your own family tree and, or have it done, uh, and then... Well, you can do it. Well, I could do it, yeah. yes. <laughs> I mean, I, I got, a, I got a, a factory, of, not a factory, but a whole institution of genealogists who do, obviously, the family trees. But you could inter interweave the narratives, which would be a very interesting book, because your family was in slavery, and, you know, they're probably... 90, you got to remember, 90% of all of, of our ancestors lived in the South until 1910. 90% on every federal census, up to 1910, 90% of the black community was still living in the 11 Confederate states. That's a fact. They're the Great Migration, which really started to take off in 1890. So it would be interesting just to see where your people were. And the other thing is the, uh, the genealogical staff at the museum is, is superb, but so is the one right on Newberry Street uh, at the New England Genealogical Society. They are one of the um, fact-checking mm -hmm genealogical units for all of our work, which we have to do because it's PBS. Just like the Broad fact checks all our DNA stuff. So you, you just might have them do your, your DNA. They've done Annette's, uh, they did mine. Um, they're very, very good. Uh, it's just something to think about. Mm -hmm. And it might completely be irrelevant, but it might give you a fascinating uh, intertwining narrative uh, take on, on that sack. It's a crazy idea, but you know, well, it's, it's, I'm a literary it's, critic. I, mean, I can make stuff up. <laughs> um, I mean, form is very important to me in this project. I'm not sure that I will be creative as I as I wish I would be. I'm not sure if I'll be able to give myself that that license. But, but this kind of um, of a record, you know, um, of, of of material, it asks for, I think, a creativity of form. I think it would be a shame. I hope I don't do it. I hope I don't do it, you all, if I just turned out a regular you know, historical monograph mm. about this. It, it would be a disservice. Yeah. Do your trade. Yeah. You got to lose. <laughs> I don't, I don't hmm. Couple more questions. Uh, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, and I actually oh. wanted to hear a bit more about the speculative nature of the work, right? Because I think there's, there's a way that in hearing you talk about the sack and the potentials of the dress, I kept thinking about the way that scholars like Sadia Hartman, Lisa Lowe, and others have tried to really engage with, um, I don't know if that's me or, uh, have tried to engage with this question of speculating. Yeah. Right? And, and not seeing it as something that as historians, right, we're sort of opposed to, mm -hmm. but rather something that um, a questionable engagement with all sources, right, mm -hmm. would allow us to. Um, I think the point that you were raising about, you know, kind of looking at the documents that are already in place, whether it's slave list and others, um, there's a push to sort of see those as the valid documents, right? But I think what you're proposing, and, and I'd love for you to say a bit more about this, is how by allowing ourselves to speculate right, on the lives right, that are embodied in the sack, right, we're able to look, um, take a, sort of another glance at what it was like to live right, and survive in this process. So just speak a bit more, if you can, about that speculative nature, mm -hmm. nature of historiography. Yeah, thank you. One of the ways that I'm trying. One of the ways that I'm trying to, to enter into that uh, is by. I'm sorry, dear. It's okay. I'm just a stage director. So then you two, is that okay, Christian? Yeah. And then we'll be done. Go ahead. Okay, thanks. So um, one of the things I'm trying to do is to um, lean into um, black feminist thinking and also 
historical work by black women who are feminists, although that work isn't necessarily viewed as, as theoretical. So um, as you kind of intuited, yes, I'm relying on Saidiya Hartman's work. I'm thinking about this as a recombinant narrative or, or trying to. I'm thinking about this as um, a narrative that, that tries to bring the past together you know, with the present. And while I'm not inventing scenes, I am having to, um, having to write scenes that I can only you know, piece together based on something like the architecture of, of the house. So I try to place Rose uh, in, in that, um, on that Martin estate, the one that, that I showed you, by looking at the architecture, by knowing where the slave quarters are, you know, and so on. Did I ever, I mean, let's see. No, I think I thought about trying to write some fictional passages about Rose, but I couldn't let myself do it. I just could not cross that line in this project. I, I think that others you know, could and might with this material. Uh, I haven't been able to. I, I'm also really leaning into the work of Marisa Fuentes and, um, and there, I, I, took a, I took a line of hers where, where she says that she's, Risa Fuentes is a study of slavery in the Caribbean. She looks particularly at uh, Barbados uh, and gender. And she has this wonderful ability and, and method where she'll take a little scrap, like a, um, an advertisement, and she'll just she'll track it down, and then she'll just open it out. So she has this, this line where she says that her reading practice is, is um, kind of um, to read along the bias grain. And so uh, as I'm getting into fabric, I went and looked that up and you know, wrote, you know, wrote, wrote to friends who said, like, what's the bias grain? Well, it's that, that, that part of the fabric, I can't see what I'm wearing, but it's that part, yes, 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 exactly. Uh, it's, that, it's, it's, that, it's like the seam where, where if you pull it, there's more gift. So I wrote Marisa and said, are you, do you sew, do you, you know, where did you get this from? And she said that she doesn't sew, but she just liked the idea. So I like that idea too. So I'm trying to apply that as a method to think about um, not only this sack as um, kind of um, an archive of its own and, and um, an alternative to the archives that we tend to turn to so much, but also um, this sack as an inspiration for thinking about how um, the flexible nature of textiles can help us to think about the other kinds of, of evidence that we have that we tend to think of as being rigid. So applying this kind of bias grain reading. Okay. Um, you, you, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Why don't you ask the three questions and then you can answer them. Make sense? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say thank you so much. I'm, a, I'm an artist. And so for me, when I first heard of this, I was just like taken away when I read about it online and hearing your lecture. And I guess, I guess I wanted to encourage you like others is to, I, I know you probably don't identify as an artist, but it doesn't mean that you can't bring that type of creativity as Professor Gay or Uncle Skipper and uh, Sadia Hartman and others may use because as you talked about, it's a kind of magical realist proposition, the whole situation, the way that the, the woman who found the, the 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 object had a dream and that informed her mm -hmm. and so as an artist and who uses scholarly research to think about creative things i'm like it's ready for you <laughs> just <laughs> write the book or do the intertwining narrative so i wanted to just say that to you as an artist and also i wanted to ask do you have any information on the pecans and some of the other artifacts that were found and the last thing i want to just say we we saw a lecture a couple of weeks ago about these um, spiritual amulets in, in what they called um, and you know on some levels this is like a sack of a prayer and yes. it it's it's not just a sack like you said the dress is a shelter so I'm just wondering about this as a sacred artifact of prayer embodied in this material culture so I just wanted yes. to hear well I, you got no letter. The other two questions. I don't know if I can keep all that was like like three questions oh, okay. so let me just see if I can respond to that you're a novelist yes. What are we doing here? So, so, I, so, so what, thank you for what you said. Okay. I thank you for, what, that's all I want to say. <laughs> I thank you for what you said. I really appreciate that. Um, because I do like to have my lines. 
you know, bet between you know, the different kinds of work I'm doing. And I think it's partly because I never want people who would be inclined to be able to dismiss my work and say, oh, that's all a bunch of bunk. Mm -hmm. it's, it's important, this work we do. Um, but I, I appreciate what you said, because so much of it is about making the decision and, and giving oneself permission. Um, about the pecans and the, and, and the bag, and yes to all of it. I, I have been researching pecans. In fact, I'm going to the Arboretum soon to go see some um, pecan trees. I want to see what they can, you know, feel like and act like. Um, the pecan information is, is pretty interesting. I won't go into it too much, but, but just to say that pecans actually were not just growing on every street uh, in Rose's um, lifetime in South Carolina, because they're actually native to the Mississippi Valley area and closer to Texas. Uh, they, I mean, now they're all over the place in Georgia, right? They're a major industry there, but they weren't at the time. So they would have been something that was hard for her um, to get her hands on. Uh, as, as far as uh, the amulet, the, the, the kind of the spirit bag idea, yes, absolutely, I'm thinking about that. Um, and then I started to go to these strange places in my mind, which I don't know. Um, in terms of thinking about not just the, the sack as perhaps being like a, a medicine bundle, you know, a root, a root worker, you know, kind of bag, but also the work that we do as being something similar. Great questions. Yes. 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 Professor Miles, uh, if time if time permits, I was hoping you could expand on your analysis of the braid a little bit. I was just thinking about the bodily autonomy that Rose had to exert to yes. cut her own hair for this purpose, yes. and the fragility of holding a braid together in the sack, which is usually tied at one end, but must have been tied at both ends in order to mm -hmm. stay together. And then, you know, prior to DNA testing, the type of story a braid could tell, um, the color and the texture about her family's geneal genealogy, and if you think she was trying to do any of that work by passing that specific object down. Thank you. Great. And the final question? Uh, thank you so much for such a generous talk. Um, I'm curious about what this, what Ashley Sack does to our methodology as people who are kind of looking through the archive. And I really appreciate how you called it a document. And I'm thinking about both methodology after the encounter with this document, right? And somebody has already mentioned, you know, making room for speculation and making room for this affect and the spirit and, you know, in doing this, in writing about it or writing from it, but also methodology in looking for the object or the document in itself. And I think the slave list is, um, it's sort of easy to encounter, like we know where those archives are kept, but this was just found in a bin someplace. So as scholars who are sort of looking for this history, like is it just about sort of waiting for someone to happen upon this type of document or is there a way we can craft a methodology to, to really be finding these things? Hey, thank you both, wonderful questions. There are maybe 10 questions and, and incredible um, thoughts that you just shared. Um, yes, Jelani, to the, to the hair. Um, to all the thoughts that you shared. One of the thoughts you shared that I had not thought about, though, was about a braid being open and closed, open on one end and closed on one end, so, so thank you for that. But I'm thinking of the braid um, around everything that you said, basically. I mean, um, Rose claiming her own body, um, continuity, uh, uh, the braid carrying DNA, the, the braid being a material representation of um, a family line all the way back to the very beginning, um, the braid representing history. Um, but I did, I wrote a lot of this, I was really you know, go, kind of going off on, on the braid. And then that's when I hit this idea that, that I keep sharing with you again and again. It's a concern, as I know that you're picking up, which is I'm not, I don't know that what Rose would have thought or what Ruth would have thought. So I'm trying to be very careful in my writing. Um, not to ascribe too much to them and to, to kind of show where I'm thinking and where things are opening out. The last question about the archive. I think that how it changes our practice is, it's first of all, a pretty, you know, a fundamental suggestion, which is that we need to look outside of traditional archives. We need to look outside of papers. We need to look at um, objects. We need to look at things that, that seem like they're not going to take us places. Um, because they very well may. There have been other people who've taken up this sack, and, and they're probably wise, and some people I really admire, uh, and decide not to work on it. Um, this feels to me riskier than it may sound <laughs> to you. Um, 
but I think that's a decision that we can make, or at least you know, we can make at certain stages of career to say, you know what, there's no evidence, but, but this is critically important. The other thing that I want to add to that is, I think there is room for serendipity. I think there is room for spirit in the work that we do. I think that we do need to be open. I think we do need to go to places that, we, um, that might be off our you know, kind of beaten path and see what happens. Hey, thank you very much, Iwan. Thank you, Taya. Thank you very much. Yeah.